Welcome to Reversing Hashimoto's show. I'm your show host, Dr. Anshul Gupta, the world expert in Hashimoto's disease. I help people reverse their thyroid conditions by making personalized functional medicine plans. You can work with me with any part of the country now by making virtual functional medicine appointments. To book an appointment, look at the show notes. In this show, I am going to get experts from all over the world who are going to share latest information that will help you to reclaim your life back from dreadful thyroid disease. So welcome here. And today we have with us Dr. Evan Hirsch. Welcome Dr. Evan Hirsch. Dr. Gupta, thanks so much for having me on. Thank you so much. Let me start with your introduction. So Dr. Evan Hirsch is a world renowned energy expert and is a founder and CEO of the International Center for Fatigue. Through his best-selling book, podcast, and international online programs that can be accessed from everywhere, he has helped thousands of people around the world optimize their energy and resolve their mystery symptoms naturally without medications and is on a mission to help one million more. He has been featured on television, podcasts, and summits. And when he's not at the office, you can find him singing musicals dancing hip hop and playing basketball with his family wonderful welcome to the summit thanks so much for having me on great wonderful i'm looking forward to have a great discussion because we're going to talk about fatigue in hashimotos and several people with hashimoto suffer from fatigue and definitely we would like to go into the details about what causes fatigue and how they can get better excellent yeah i'm excited to contribute but before we start, you know, you yourself actually struggled with fatigue in your life. So we'd like to kind of start with your story of what happened to you and how you got better. Absolutely. So I was working in a brick and mortar uh, at the time that I got fatigued. So I had started my functional medicine practice already. I had come out of residency. I was already practicing for a couple of years and my energy started to go downhill to the point where all of a sudden I was napping underneath the desk and essentially hiding from my life, hiding from my staff, hiding from patients, hiding from my family at home. And my energy just kept going down and things just kept getting worse. I got awful brain fog. I couldn't remember the patient sitting in front of me, except for my medical record. I had body pain and I had this awful crushing fatigue. And so it was finally after several years of sleeping underneath that desk where I was looking up and I was like, I have to do something about this. I just felt so much guilt because here I'm helping all these people and I'm practicing functional medicine and I can't even help myself. And so I decided, okay, that was the pivotal moment for me where I was like, enough of this. I'm now going to go on a mission to fix my problems. And so I went and read everything that I could and attended every seminar and, and conference that I could to figure out all of the causes. Because I knew from a functional medicine perspective and an environmental medicine perspective that if I could find all of my causes, I could fix them and I could be successful. And so that's what I did. And I found that there were 33 different causes of fatigue and that everybody who had fatigue and has fatigue has 20 plus causes. And I had 30 of those 33 different causes that we're going to talk about today. And one by one, I would find each of them and I would remove it and my energy would get a little bit better along the way until eventually I have the really great energy that I have today. And so I made it my mission to, I wrote a book and I made it my mission to um, help a million people resolve their fatigue so that they can be happier and have more fun in life. Because that's what I found that I was missing is that not only was I tired, but I was unhappy. And so now that I have more energy and you know, energy affects every single aspect of life and mindset is a big part of the work that we do, I'm, I'm so much happier with my life and I have more fun. That's great. That's an inspiring story. You know, like uh, 33 causes, that's a lot. So I'm sure, you know, our listeners are already overwhelmed with so many causes because most people think that, okay, they might have just one root cause or two root causes. But, you know, you pointed out correctly that so many people have more than one root cause or root causes. And all of those needs to be addressed to get better. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's it's one of those things that is the main reason why people don't get better is because they stop looking for causes or they don't know that there are 33 causes to look for. Now, it's not going to take you 
you know, a longer period of time, if you have 33 causes versus, you know, less causes, the reality is, is that once you know which causes you have, then you can actually match up the treatments with the cause that you have. And you're going to just be a lot more successful. You're not going to go years, not knowing that you have mold toxicity or heavy metal toxicity or a particular infection that's keeping you from achieving your ideal self. Absolutely. So let's talk about all these causes. Why people with Hashimoto's are feeling fatigue. Tell us about that. Yeah. So let's, yeah, let's do that first. Why people who have Hashimoto's are also fatigued. Now, it just so happens that all of these causes that we're talking about today of fatigue are also the causes of autoimmunity. And as we know, and I'm sure other people have talked about, and I know you've spoken about it extensively when you were on my podcast and other things, is that Hashimoto's is part an autoimmune condition. And then the other part is having low thyroid itself. And so that autoimmune condition where the immune system is damaging the thyroid, the immune system has to be reacting to something. And oftentimes that thing is going to be, when we're looking at all these causes, it's going to be the toxicities, which we'll get to in a moment. So there are things that are in your body that aren't supposed to be there. And it's the immune system's job to remove those things out of the body. And if those toxicities are hiding, then then the immune system has to go through human tissue in order to get at them. So for example, with the thyroid, if there's an infection that is in the thyroid, the immune system is going to try to get it. it. But unfortunately, it has to go through, it has to break off those pieces of the thyroid in order to try to get at the infection because it knows that it's there because how the infection manifests and it puts its flag up on the cell and says, hey, guess what? I'm here. And so that's why the immune system is reacting against it. Unfortunately, it leads to this cascade where you're just damaging the thyroid. And then as many people with Hashimoto's know is that one autoimmune condition can lead to another autoimmune condition because then maybe you get autoimmunity in the joints and you get something that appears to be something like rheumatoid arthritis. So that's the answer to the first question is that I didn't answer it fully, but then what ends up happening from these toxicities that trigger that autoimmunity that attacks the thyroid and causes Hashimoto's is that ends up damaging the mitochondria. Now the mitochondria produces about 80 to 90% of our energy. And so when that happens, then your energy is going to tank significantly. The toxins also are gonna mess with your hormones. And so consequently, they play a huge role in energy as well. So you're getting a one-two punch here that are going to significantly decrease your energy in addition to causing that autoimmunity to the thyroid and Hashimoto's. Awesome, yes, you know, I love the mitochondria aspect of things. That's what I talk about, you know, like how in Hashimoto's, the ultimate destruction is of the mitochondria. And that's the reason of all the symptoms that people go through. So I'm glad that you brought up the mitochondria component to it. Yeah. So let's dive into the causes then. So when we're looking at these causes of these 33 different causes, and don't get overwhelmed by that number, because you'll see it kind of makes sense in a moment, is that we can separate it into deficiencies and toxicities. So deficiencies are things that are not in the body that are supposed to be in the body. So if you're deficient in hormones like adrenals, thyroid, sex hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, if you're deficient in mitochondria, if you're deficient in vitamins and minerals, if you're deficient in lifestyle habits where you're not getting enough sleep, not enough movement, not enough good food, and not enough water. So those are all kind of the deficiencies. And then deficiencies in neurotransmitters. So dopamine, serotonin, those sorts of things, GABA that aren't in the body the way that they're supposed to. So those are things that are not in the body and they're supposed to be in the body. So those are deficiencies. And then with the toxicities, we're looking at things like heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, allergies, negative emotional patterns, and electromagnetic fields. So when we're looking at heavy metals, we're looking at things like mercury. There's 100,000 pounds of mercury that are dumped into our oceans every year that we're exposed to. When we're looking at chemicals, there's 86,000 different chemicals that we're exposed to on a regular basis. Some studies have shown that before you get out of the house in the morning, you may be exposed to three to 500 different chemicals. And all of these things are going to damage the mitochondria, upset the hormones, increase autoimmunity. When we're looking at molds, we're looking at about half the buildings in first world countries have water damage, and most of those have molds. 
Mold is a huge cause of Hashimoto's. And then when we're looking at infections, there can be Lyme type infections like Borrelia, Bartonella, which is a major one that I've seen with Hashimoto's that we can talk about more in a little bit, Babesia, Anaplasma, there can be Epstein-Barr virus and other viruses that can cause monotype illnesses, mononucleosis type illnesses like cytomegalovirus, HHV6. And then there's the allergies, negative emotional patterns, which are basically anything, anything that's happened to you in your life that has increased stress, that has changed the way that you look at the world. These are oftentimes called ACEs, adverse childhood events. And that can be anything from really significant abuse to something that may be considered more mild, like I had, like rejection of a peer group. When that happens to you, it increases stress on the human organism. Um, on the brain, increases the stress on the adrenals and other hormones. And consequently, that can set the stage for allowing a number of these toxicities to take hold, and then consequently, all the subsequent damage. And then electromagnetic fields, anything that has a battery or emits any sort of wavelength or frequency can damage DNA, increase inflammation in the body, as well as autoimmunity. So I just said a whole bunch, but big picture is there are deficiencies and there are toxicities. And this process or the, the main causes are the toxicities that end up causing 90% of the deficiencies, as well as the autoimmunity in the process of Hashimoto's. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, that's very comprehensive and a detailed list of things. So, I mean, in your practice or, you know, people will have this question, how they can find all these root causes, you know, like, because most of the regular labs will not have access to these testing. So are there tests available, you know, for all these toxicities and deficiencies, or is it basically on clinical experience? So most of it is clinical experience. And so what I have found is that 75% of these different causes can be determined by symptoms alone. So that's 27 out of the 33 different causes. And so this is one thing when people join our program, they open up the workbook and the first part in step one, they take them about an hour or so, and they'll be able to go through that process just based off of their symptoms. And they'll know 75% of the causes. The other 25% that they need labs for are the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds and the stool test. And that's what I have found has been to be most helpful. Okay. So that makes sense, you know, like, because obviously some practitioners, you know, like before even the patient signs up, you know, like have them like a battery of tests to be done uh, to like look for everything, which can be overwhelming for the patient, but obviously it's also Mm -hmm. cost prohibitive. So glad that you're on similar page that, you know, there is also clinical signs and symptoms that can point us towards, you know, like what are the problems? And then, as you said, you know, we definitely need some testing just to check for more specific things. So that's good to know. Yeah. And the testing really is needed when there are certain causes that show up with a conglomeration of symptoms that look very similar. They're just harder to discern. And so that's, that's when I recommend the testing. Absolutely. Great. So I think, you know, all of all those causes and toxicities, the infections kind of intrigues me the most. So I think if we can delve into the infection piece of it, like, uh, and see like what particular infections you have seen associated with Hashimoto's, uh, that'll be great. Yeah, I'd love to talk about Bartonella. And we're going to, we'll start off with a story of when I first saw this in my practice, maybe about seven years ago or so, we'll call our patient Sarah. And so Sarah comes in and she has pain on the bottom of her feet. She's got muscle cramps. She's got some body aches, having a little bit of a hard time sleeping, and she's anxious. And so um, we determined based off of those symptoms that she most likely had Bartonella, which is a bacteria that is found in upwards of 50% of all domestic animals. If you've ever been licked in a face with an animal, it's very likely that you have this. You can also get it from ticks. You can get it from mosquitoes. You can get it from a blood transfusion. There's lots of different ways of getting it. But in her particular case, we noticed those symptoms and we started treating her with herbs for Bartonella. What was really interesting that ended up happening is that that night she calls me up and she says, you know, I'm having symptoms of Graves' disease. Now, Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism. And so hyperthyroidism is producing too much thyroid. And I said, well, how do you know you had Graves? And she's like, well, I had it 
you know, 15 years ago, and it felt the same. My heart is racing. I can't sleep. My anxiety is worse. I'm having diarrhea. She had all the classic signs. And I was like, well, I don't know what's going on. I was like, did you take your thyroid? Are you taking the same dose of thyroid? Because she was already on thyroid medicine. Turns out she hadn't changed her thyroid medication. And so I said, well, it sounds like your thyroid is working better. So I guess tomorrow I'll take a lower dose of thyroid. And I think she was on probably 60 or 120 milligrams of armor thyroid at that point. Now, over the course of the next couple of months, we were able to wean her off of her thyroid medication completely. And over time, I have seen that about half of the people who have Hashimoto's and have Bartonella are able to wean off of their medication, their thyroid medication significantly. Sometimes it's not entirely 100% off of it like it was with Sarah. Sometimes you're getting it down to just a little bit that you still need to take. But what that told me was that Bartonella was living inside the thyroid or it was affecting the thyroid in some way that was shutting down the machinery, but that as we started going after Bartonella, we found that the thyroid turned back on and that we no longer needed as much thyroid medication or what we call exogenous thyroid or thyroid from the outside of the body. And it was as we ramped up on the Bartonella treatment that we were able to decrease the, um, the thyroid medication. So, and I've seen this with other infections, anaplasma is one of them, but Bartonella is really the big one that sticks out to me. Mold sometimes can be one of them too. But Bartonella has been time and time again, um, it plays a huge role in Hashimoto's in my experience. That's great. Yes. You know, like we also see chronic infections, especially Bartonella, like, you know, causing so many Hashimoto's issues. And unfortunately, like the, you know, like the conventional medicine uh, doesn't even check for Bartonella or do not have ways of checking it properly. So how do you check for Bartonella? Like do you any particular lab that you work with or you just order like through the regular labs? I do it based off symptoms. So that's one of the 27. So if somebody has pain on the bottom of the feet or sensitivity on the bottom of the feet, usually, um, and they may be misdiagnosed with plantar fasciitis and they have muscle cramps in the body, usually in the calves, usually at night. Sometimes they have muscle pain in different parts of the body, low back pain, maybe some neck pain, oftentimes headaches from the, um, from the neck pain, and then having a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep, and then having some anxiety or depression in addition to thyroid issues. Sometimes there are some, um, some Bartonella striae, or basically looks like a cat scratch or a, a scratch mark or a stretch, uh, stretch mark without having had some changes in weight. Those are some discerning symptoms that really aren't caused by much else. And so that's when we start to look for it. And you don't have to have all those symptoms. You can have three of them. Oftentimes it's like pain on the bottom of the feet, muscle cramps, and a hard time sleeping. And sometimes these symptoms aren't every day. So you could have muscle cramps every couple of weeks, or you could have pain on the bottom of the feet that is worse some days than others. Sometimes it's burning on the bottom of the feet. And sometimes it's, you get out of bed and your feet are just kind of sensitive and you want to get into slippers, which are just going to provide you some more comfort throughout the day. But that's how we discern Bartonella. And, you know, the other thing too, is that when you're using herbs, that are uh, more specific for a particular organism. Now we know that there are herbs that will, will cover other infections, but oftentimes we can kind of pinpoint certain ones. And we know that if there's die off, if you're killing off the infection, if symptoms get better, or symptoms get worse, you're on the right track because you just have to mitigate the amount of die off that somebody's having, where basically it's this reaction from killing the infection, the immune system is reacting to it that you just have to proceed and ramp up on the antimicrobial, the killing herbs that you're using that then allows you to get rid of the symptoms that are being caused by the infection over time. Great. So you don't use like prescription medications or antibiotics for Bartonella, right? You know, you're using a more herbal approach, right? To treat it, right? Correct. And we actually don't use any antibiotics or any prescriptions at all because I operate as a health coach in the online space so that I can practice across state and national lines. We have about a third of our clientele is in Europe and is in Australia and New Zealand. And so, yeah, so everything that we do is natural and, and supplement based. That is great because again, a lot of, you know, uh, patients that to come to see us, you know, they have been to other doctors and they have been on chronic antibiotics for sometimes years. And I always get worried about, you know, like the downside effect of those. 
And that's where I'm also in more of the herbal space because I feel more comfortable and obviously the side effects are much more lower than that. Yeah, I agree. And that's actually one of the reasons why I moved into functional medicine and why I moved into the online space when I no longer felt the need that, to prescribe is that we we know that, what is it, the, t- the number three killer in this country um, is medications. And I saw that in my residency and it's not really something that I wanted to do. So when I found out that there were other ways to treat the conditions that we were seeing and we could actually reverse them and not have people reliant on us, I was all in. And that's been, that's been a goal of mine for many years. That is great. Any particular herbal supplement or do you use like a mix of herbal supplements for Bartonella? I'm a big fan of the Byron White formulas when it comes to infections. And so they have a formula called Abart which I definitely wouldn't recommend for people to run out and get right now because this stuff is so potent. You definitely need the guidance of a practitioner who's knowledgeable in it, but it's so potent that sometimes the results can come just from rubbing one drop on the hands and increasing every week by a drop sort of thing. So you, and you want to balance it out with making sure you have enough die-off support in the form of binders, sarsaparilla, tri salts, a number of these other components that can allow you to then progress with the killing of the, the infections because you're not having a lot of side effects from doing so. But in the ABART product, there's neem, there's, I always forget the list, but it's just a wonderful combination and, and works really well. Yes, you know, the Byron White formulas are so wonderful. You know, we use it them for so many different infections, you know, like, you know, HSV infections, Bartonella, you know, like the BCA and their products are amazing, but you correctly pointed out they are so potent, you know, like I sometimes get worried that people just try to kind of get it off, you know, from other spaces and start using it. And generally they will get a lot of die-off reactions from them. Yeah. And, you know, when if you Google Byron White formulas online or if you Google Abart, what you'll see is, you know, this product ruined my life or this product was awful. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that people think it's just like any other tincture and they haven't prepared the body appropriately by opening up the detox pathways like we do in step three of our four step process so that they end up feeling worse. And consequently, you can you can set off a cascade which ends up with this uh, ongoing die-off in addition to uh, what I call the whack-a-mole effect, where all of a sudden you're causing other infections to pop out. So another infection that I see commonly in fatigue and oftentimes in this context of Hashimoto's is an infection called Babesia. And oftentimes it's running with Bartonella and it'll cause spontaneous sweats in people. It's kind of like the North American malaria. It's an intracellular organism, so it's inside the cell, but it can cause spontaneous sweats either during the day, at night, and this can happen every day or every couple of days or every couple of weeks. People will oftentimes have shortness of breath. They'll usually have awful sleep and then they can have really awful mood issues. So anxiety to the point of panic attacks and depression to the point of suicidal thoughts. So, and you don't have to have all those symptoms, but having a couple of them can really indicate Babesia. And so some of these people, they start taking the ABART for Bartonella, and then all of a sudden Babesia pops out and what, what I call the whack-a-mole. And then you have to address the Babesia as well in order to get rid of those symptoms. So it's always a combination and, and we don't know exactly what's happening. I call it the whack-a-mole where one infection pops out when you go after another one, much like that game, when you go to the fair or whatever. But I've also, um, there's also this component of what I call Bortonesia for people who are really sick with these infections, which is kind of like a combination of Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia, where we know that these bugs get under the biofilm, which is like this collagenous material that sits on top of the uh, mucous membranes. And these bugs swap their DNA and they're essentially creating super bugs. So sometimes when we're going after Bartonella per se, and we're kind of sectioning off, let's say there's a super bug that has Bartonella as a component of it. Oftentimes that's released some of the other infections um, as well. And that's why they show up. And this is something that we're seeing right now with the pandemic virus and long haulers is that 
that virus can, can cause over 250 different symptoms. And some of those are from the virus itself and where it is in the body. And some of those are with this whack-a-mole approach. If we're addressing the virus, and then all of a sudden you get Babesia symptoms, and then we address Babesia, those symptoms go away. So it's really this combination of these infections. I call it the toxic matrix because you've also got heavy metals, chemicals, and molds that are in there where if you start going after some of these things, it kind of breaks up this matrix, and then it releases a number of these toxins. So you have to be really prepared to bind up these toxins as they're being released to make sure the detoxification pathways are open so that you're going to actually feel better instead of feeling worse through this process. And that's really where kind of the handholding comes in. Um, so you really want to make sure that you can get your questions answered on a regular basis from your practitioner um, so that you don't feel worse when it happens. Absolutely. So when you see these multiple infections, you know, do you treat all of them together, like with different herbs, or you just go one after the other? So I always like to go after whoever's calling my name or whoever's front and center. So if somebody has all the symptoms of, of Babesia, then I'm going to go after that one first. Okay. Cause inevitably there's usually, I shouldn't say I, you know, 75% of the time um, you get this whack-a-mole effect. So there's other infections that are present that may not be front and center, but, and sometimes those other symptoms will end up popping out at you. And so that's the way that I work it. And, and that seems to work well. And what ends up happening is that you are addressing a number of infections at a time, but you're really only ramping up on one at a time so that you can actually see what happens because the die-off symptoms that people experience are pretty much the same as their normal symptoms of the infection, but worse. So let's say somebody has Bartonella symptoms. So they got the pain on the bottom of the feet, the muscle cramps, problems sleeping, anxiety, depression, and you start going after Bartonella, and then all of a sudden the muscle cramps get worse. Well, that means you need to increase your die-off support. That's the die-off that's happening or what's called a Herxheimer reaction, where the immune system is reacting to the, the toxicity of the bug dying, okay? And so that's how we know that that's die-off from that particular organism. If we start going after Bartonella and then all of a sudden the person starts sweating like crazy, then we know that that's most likely that they've got the Babesia. Maybe they've got air hunger as well and, heart, and their sleep gets progressively worse. So that's when we know we have to go after Babesia. So that's, that's how we work it. That's great. I mean, you know, like I think like, you know, medicine people are losing the art of clinical practice. So I'm glad that you're using your clinical expertise and knowledge in figuring out, you know, which is calling the first and that's where you're going after and making those changes real time. And as you pointed out, that is very important to work with a practitioner where you have access to all the time so that these, you know, like symptoms can be dealt with timely manner rather than just waiting for a month or two before you can have access to your practitioner. Yeah, it's so important, you know, and oftentimes as, as patients, we think, um, is this something that I need to reach out for help? And, you know, if you're in a group, like we have an online community where people can ask questions every day, and then twice a month, you can get um, group one-on-ones with me. And then we've got one-on-ones with our health coaches and our nervous system retraining coach. So there's always places along the way where people are asking you, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And so it kind of, it gives you this insight where you're, you're, you're getting this awareness around, okay, if I'm feeling worse, I know that I need to reach out for help and it's accepted and it's expected. It's not a hindrance and it's not a bother. That is great. You know, that's awesome that you provide that, you know, support, you know, um, you know all the time. So, which is great. So now when you pointed out very like, you know, important things is that don't do these things on, on their own. And, you know, like a lot of these things, you know, are complicated, like, you know, their toxins and their infections. Now, do you have a process, you know, in your four-step process where you start dealing with one thing first and then go to the second thing and the third thing so that, you know, people have an idea about it? So can you walk us through that process? Absolutely. So the first step in the four-step process is assessing the causes. So like we talked about, there's 33 different causes. Everybody who has fatigue and an autoimmune condition like Hashimoto's has 20 plus causes. I had 30. Hopefully you don't have that many. Um, and 75% of these causes can be determined by symptoms alone. But that's what you want to do in the first step of this process is figure out what causes you have, right? Because that's the only way you're going to be successful. 
The second step is to re replace the deficiency. So we talked about these causes being deficiencies and toxicities, right? So we start by replacing the deficiencies, adrenals, thyroid, mitochondria, we call that the big three. And that's really making the body more robust. And, you know, a lot of integrative docs, um, health coaches, natural docs, even conventional docs will be pretty good at this first part where you're boosting those deficiencies. And then you're also working on lifestyle habits. Okay. Now that's great, but the gold is really in the toxicities in step four. But in order to get there, we've got to make you strong enough to deal with the stress of removing the toxins. And so that's kind of what we're doing in step two by replacing the deficiencies. And then in step three, we're opening up these detoxification pathways. Detoxification is kind of a, a misused word a lot these days. So it, basically we have these processes in the body that remove toxins out of the body. And when you have fatigue and autoimmunity, those pathways are clogged. And so we're talking about like intestines, you know, you need to make sure you're having a bowel movement every day. You want to make sure that liver and kidney pathways are open. These are filters. What happens if you haven't changed your filter for years, it's clogged, right? And so you want to make sure that you're opening that up. We've got the lymph, which is the garbage system of the body, right? And what moves lymph? Movement. And what are we have an epidemic of? being static, right? Not moving enough as humans, right? So we're not getting those toxicities out of our lymph system. And then we have a glymphatic system or basically a neural lymph system or brain lymph where we've got trash um, that's being taken out of the brain, right? And so we wanna dump all those down this, I envision it like a funnel where you're kind of dumping these down the body and so that you can remove these toxicities in step four. Because what ends up happening is that if you grab a toxicity in step four and you bring it into this funnel, if the funnel is full, this toxicity is just going to go right back into the body, right? It's not going to go out, right? And so that's kind of what we, that's, that's kind of what we want with the funnel. So that's what happens in step three. And interesting part of my story, we talked about intestines and you want to have a bowel movement ideally twice a day. I, for the first 22 so years of my life, I had a bowel movement once a week. So this was a huge part of the reason why I had chronic fatigue and autoimmunity is because I had those toxins that couldn't get out of my body. They would just get reabsorbed from the intestines. And so my levels of chemicals, heavy metals, molds, they just increased. I wasn't able to get them out. So really important step three. And then step four, we always like to start with heavy metals, chemicals, and molds because getting those things, and we do some of, some of the products that we use, we actually start in step three, but we want to start binding and we want to start making sure that whenever we start addressing this toxic matrix, this ball of toxins, is that when that matrix starts opening up, that there is something around, some supplement around that's going to help bind up those toxins because they are intrinsic to that toxic matrix. So the heavy metals, the chemicals, and the molds, because they all get released when you start down this path. So that's kind of what we do first. And then we go after the infections. And the entire time we're going after mindset and we're going after negative emotional patterns. So we've got a, a four-step mind step process that we take people through. And then we also have a nervous system, a trauma-informed, two trauma-informed nervous system retraining coaches on our staff so that they offer one-on-ones and they offer groups for people who are going through our programs. Cause we wanna make sure we leave no stone unturned. We know that these are all the causes and we wanna make sure that people are going to be as successful as possible. So we wanna, we wanna make sure that there's handholding along the way for every single aspect of this. That's great. So that's awesome. You know, that four step process, you know, is very easy to follow. Like, you know, people can uh, get an understanding of, you know, how that works. So the infection is the last thing that you address in your program. Is that correct? It's not the last thing. It's close to the last thing. I would say that uh, electromagnetic fields are the last thing because those are, they're a whole um, challenge in their own right. Mm -hmm. And that people who are sensitive to the electromagnetic fields by reducing the overall body burden of all of these toxins, they become less sensitive. So it's really hard to avoid them. There's certain techniques that we do in order to help people with this, but that is what we do last. And there's sometimes where we have to skip ahead. We had somebody recently in our program who was having diarrhea 
And so we jumped ahead to um, the gut stuff and we found there were gut infections. And so we were treating those. I think there was yeast and there were some other bacteria as well. And so we gave them what they needed, a little bit of, of step two, three, so that we could get them into step four. And we just wanted to make sure that we had enough step three support while they were going through that process. But yeah, we just don't like to take too much time before we get into step four. You know, our goal is for them to have, be into step four, like month three, month four out of a six month program. Um, Cause it oftentimes it can take four, six, 12, 24 months in order to get rid of some of these different causes moving at a pace. That's, that is really what the body wants. Body likes slow changes, slow and steady wins the race you know, and so body like small changes rather. So, yeah, so we want to get after the infections as soon as possible, but we want to set people up for success. Lyme disease, you know, like, because it is a, like a lot of people like, you know, believe in like chronic Lyme disease causing infections or causing the autoimmune process. And some people don't believe in it. And a lot of people approach it in a more conventional way of treating like, you know, with IV or like, you know, antibiotics for years and years. So what is your approach towards Lyme disease? So with Lyme disease, I come from the school of thought, once again, that it is a clinical diagnosis, you know, and this is what the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta say, and what my mentors have learned uh, year after year. And so in terms of the Lyme disease, you can't have Borrelia unless you have two symptoms. You have to have symptoms that come and go, where some days are, are worse than others, and you have to have symptoms that move around the body. And so this can be joint pain, muscle pain, or nerve pain that move around the body. But like, let's say, you know, one week it's in the shoulder and then the next week or the next month it's in the knee, right? Whatever that symptom is. And so if you don't have those symptoms, you don't really have Borrelia. And to be honest, once we go through this process and we're kind of, and you don't want to address Borrelia first, you want to address it last. It's like the big mama that sits at the middle of this toxic matrix. And so once we get down there, oftentimes the immune system does its thing and kind of takes care of the Borrelia. If it doesn't, then we're going to use herbs to go after it. But yes, chronic Lyme is definitely a thing. Oftentimes when people are talking about chronic Lyme, they're also now including these co-infections, like we talked about, Bartonella, Babesia, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, Epstein-Barr virus. These are all infections that kind of run with Lyme or Borrelia. And so we have to keep that in mind as well. But chronic Lyme is definitely a thing and definitely needs to be addressed. And what is the general approach? You know, are you on the camp of like, you know, uh, having long-term antibiotics on board or, you know, you're again more of an herbal guy helping patients through that route? Yeah, once again, no antibiotics, no medications here. We'll use the AL complex by Byron White formulas, which works really well. Sometimes we'll, when what's interesting too, is that, you know, it doesn't have cat's claw in that formula, which is kind of a, a major tool that a lot of people use, but what does have cat's claw is ABAB, which we use for Babesia. And so you're get, you're getting on board a number of, you know, these, these herbs are doing double and triple duty. And so oftentimes that's why what we see is that we don't have to go after Borrelia once we've gone after some of these other co-infections because they've been addressed in the process. A lot of people have this question that, you know, like we have these like chronic infections, let's say Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella and all those things. How are they able to evade, you know, our immune system and still stay in our body and can cause harm? Great question. And so this has to do with having an intact immune system. So if the immune system is functioning correctly, it should be keeping these infections at bay. Okay. And we know that the stats are like our, in, in this human body, we have a, a huge number. I know that the number just changed, but it used to be that, you know, 90% of our cells in our body are infection or bug cells and 10% are our human cells. I think that that's been changed a little bit more recently, but the reality still is we have so many of these bugs, these bacteria, yeast, viruses that coexist with us where we have a symbiotic relationship until we no longer do. And that's kind of where the immune system comes into play. I think that most of us have all of these infection. It's only when you get some sort of stressor, whether it's a mental, emotional stressor, like having some sort of abuse or an adverse childhood event, or a physical stressor, like a heavy metal, a chemical, a mold, or maybe it's a big inoculation from a tick, right? But oftentimes it's not that. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think, you know, when you have heavy metals, chemicals, molds, they're going to hijack the immune system off into left field. And guess what? The immune system becomes dysfunctional. It's chasing after all of these toxins like we talked about that are hiding in the tissues. It's causing autoimmunity, causing inflammation. And guess what? Now these infections can become opportunistic and they can come out of their hiding places. They can come out of the biofilm. They start having a party. So that's why it's so important also to go after the heavy metals, the chemicals and the molds first is because in order to get rid of these infections, you have to have a mostly intact immune system. This is also one of the reasons why any sort of laboratory test that you do that is checking for immune system function is going to be inaccurate when you're dealing with all these toxins, right? Because like we just said, if you're looking to test the immune system and looking for the immune system's reaction to Borrelia, let's say Lyme, you're doing a Lyme Western blot test or an ELISA test. You're looking at the immune system's reaction to these things. Guess what? Immune system's not working well. It's not gonna be reacting normally to these particular things. So that's what's happening. And you know, the more toxins that we are exposed to over our lifetime, the more likely you are going to have this immune system dysfunction where it's not paying attention to these infections. And so I think of the, the body is like this rain barrel where over time you're just accumulating things, heavy metals, you know, you get mercury fillings, you play with mercury as a kid, you're eating tuna fish like I did every other day, uh, gluten, dairy, and then all of a sudden maybe you're constipated like me and you're reabsorbing all those things. And then you're eating foods that have pesticides on them because who knew about organic back in the 80s? And so you're getting pesticides, herbicides, glyphosate, right? And you're just filling up this barrel until it overflows, hijacks the immune system, and then the infections come out to play. Awesome. That's, that's a great explanation. And, you know, like a lot of people have this question all the time about like, how do they get these infections? And are these infections are so common that everybody gets them? Then why only in certain people, you know, like that's a big issue. So you pointed out that it's a collection of toxins and all the exposures over the course of lifetime that basically hijacks their immune system. And that ultimately leads to these infections. So that's great. Now, I mean, yeah, we talk about I, a lot about infections and things, you know, like, but, you know, like what if, if like, if you would like to give an advice to people in terms of what they can do now to improve their fatigue, what will be the few things that they can do to improve this fatigue at this point of time? So I think, you know, starting off with lifestyle habits, habits is always big. You know, that's always something that you have the power to do right now is change some of your lifestyle and behavior habits. So the first thing is you got to go to bed before 10. You know, I didn't, I never realized how important it is. Now it's different for everybody, but I never realized how important it was until I got an aura ring where it makes a huge difference. It's even like, like 945, like I have to be in bed, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll read a little something on my Kindle before I go to bed and then um, got to be asleep by 945. Otherwise I get dinged. Right. I also used to like to exercise at night. Exercise doesn't work so well for me at night. It, it, my, I, get, I get worse sleep scores. So having some sort of biofeedback device can be helpful, but you can also experiment with these things. You know, when's the right time for you to get exercise? Now, for a lot of people who have fatigue, I don't recommend that you actually do a lot of movement until you get up to an energy of like seven out of 10. Right now, you might be like a three out of 10 if 10 is ideal energy. So, so that's why it's really important to start to pay attention to lifestyle habits. You know, so sleep, you want to get seven to nine hours of sleep at night, you know, go to sleep before 10, make sure that your room is dark. There's all sorts of different strategies for doing this. You want to make sure you're drinking enough water. You know, half your body weight in ounces is kind of typically what we tell people, where if you're 160 pounds, half of your body weight would be 80 pounds. Make that into ounces. 80 ounces is what you should be consuming. But what I find is that people who have fatigue and they've got these clogged detoxification pathways, they really need three liters of water every single day. And so that's around 90 some odd ounces. Okay. And then adding in some sea salt, which can be incredibly helpful for your adrenal gland is something that you can do. When you notice that you are feeling stressed, you need to do something about it. You need to do some tapping, perhaps if you're feeling anxious, you know, do some, do some uh, electro um, EFT, some emotional freedom techniques, some tapping, tapping solution sort of thing, or you need to be doing um, something for your heart rate variability. 
you know, perhaps you're using the Inner Balance app on the App Store on your phone. Um, and so those are some things, the mindset work that we do, we talk a lot about um, gratitudes, envisioning your ideal day, um, looking at some of the disempowering beliefs that you have and flipping them into empowering beliefs, and then looking at what sort of disempowering questions you're asking yourself on a regular basis and flipping them into empowering questions. Those all have a lot of research behind them for, do, for practicing neuroplasticity, so changing the way that your brain is working so that you can be happier, you can be healthier, and you can decrease the stress that's on the human organism. So we talked about increasing water intake. We, um, we need to talk about improving the kind of good food that you're consuming, which is really more about removing bad food. So simplifying it, I say meat and vegetables is really where it's at. It's more of a paleo diet where whenever you're hungry, you just wanna reach for vegetables. You can have a little bit of fruit in there as well, but you wanna make sure you're avoiding gluten, sugar, grains, dairy, those are, those are really the big ones that kind of have to go with, you know, maybe some moderation, maybe use some different kinds of sugar, maybe some stevia, or you're, you're getting some sugar from your fruits, but the rest of it, you should, you know, gluten and dairy absolutely have to stay away from. That's one of the things that you can do right now that could potentially really help you. And with movement, you can actually, you can do something. So whatever you can, you can tolerate that is not going to make you crash is what you want to do. And so maybe that's five jumping jacks a day. Maybe that's jumping in place once. Maybe that's dancing. In our community, some of the members have taken to creating a dance party. So every couple of weeks, they somebody puts out a Zoom link and then everybody goes and they have a little bit of a dance party. That's something that we've been trying to incorporate at my home as well. I love to dance, as you guys heard from my bio. My daughter loves to dance. And so we'll move things in the kitchen and we'll try to create some space and we'll have a bit of a dance party. So something that's fun, something that'll get you moving a little bit, but not something that's necessarily going to crash what's happening. So those are things you can do right now. And then the next step would be to replace adrenal function, replace mitochondrial function, replace thyroid function, what I call the big three, when you step, when you go from like what you're doing with the lifestyle habits into starting to take some supplements in step two. Awesome. Well, that is a ton of good information and ton of good practical things that people can do right now to get better. Gosh, I mean, you know, you have, you are just an encyclopedia of such a good information and we can keep <laughs> going, but I think we are running short on time. So I think uh, we will just end over here, but thank you so much for sharing all this information. Before we let you go, where can our listeners find you? So you can find me at fixyourfatigue.com, F-I-X-Y-O-U-R-F-A-T-I-G-U-E.com. I also have a free Facebook group where we do Facebook lives on a regular basis. Every month or so, we do live Q&As. You can submit questions that I answer. There's also a lot of content that we're producing to answer a lot of the questions that we've received over the years on fatigue and on optimizing energy. And then we offer free calls for people who are interested in seeing whether or not they're a good fit um, to work with us and whether we can help them or not. Awesome. That's great. You know, like so much good information, especially on infection that you were able to cover and so many practical tips that people can do right now to improve their fatigue. Thank you. Thank you again so much for sharing all this knowledge with our listeners. Thanks for having me on. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.